Wednesday, April 11th, Saints. I wanted to go over this section of scripture over in Luke that talks about uh, when Jesus says, you will be appointed a portion with the unbelievers. Well, uh, we got to look at who he's speaking to and about what, okay? So we're going to look at the whole chapter here. Again, this is Luke chapter 12, all right? First of all, who's Jesus speaking to? He's speaking to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Under what covenant are they? They are under the old covenant law. He has not yet died, uh, been buried, and rose again, shedding his blood for the remission of sins. However, he does foreshadow that that's going to happen. All right? Also, he's speaking about hypocrites, religious self-righteous Pharisees, doctors of the law. He told them they strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. What does that mean? It means they're so uh, uh, legalistic about the details of the law that they miss the point of the law, and that is mercy and love to respect others' things, things that are sacred to them, right? Don't steal. The, it, it, your relationship with God is sacred, so you don't worship other gods. Your relationship with others is sacred because they belong to God, so you don't steal their things, you don't take their wives, etc. So it's about the heart of the law is love, right? They miss that, okay? It, for example, Jesus tells the story where uh, a, a, a Levite walks around someone that's been beaten half to death, but rather than help the man assist him, he walks to the other side of the street lest he get defiled and become ritually unclean by touching a dead body. That's, that's the thinking. They'd rather let a man die without helping him rather than get ritually unclean. That's the heart these people have. So he's mentioning the hypocrisy of these self-righteous religious leaders. All right? That's the context because the first line in this chapter uh, warns about the leaven of the Pharisees. Now, I also want to add that the Pharisees not only uh, were standing on the law, they were standing on the Talmud, which were man's traditions, rabbinical traditions, making men in bondage to things that God never gave them. Okay, for instance, uh, even to this day, I worked with an Orthodox Jew and he couldn't uh, turn the light switch on and on after the Sabbath. He couldn't, he got locked in the office and wasn't allowed to pick up a telephone to call his family to tell him he got locked in to get help. He had to stay there. I mean, these little things, you can only walk a certain amount of steps or it's considered working. I mean, the stuff that they would put on themselves was tradition and not you know, in the heart of the law, like Jesus said, you know, this, uh, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So they missed it, right? So uh, that's what's going on here. And by the way, these people do not believe him. These self-righteous religious Pharisees do not believe him. They blaspheme the Holy Spirit in the sense that they are rejecting the witness the Holy Spirit's giving them of who Jesus is. They're even calling his work, his miracles of the devil. They are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit bears witness to who Jesus is and what he's done for us, okay? So that's the context. Let's look at it. It, it, it drives me crazy when people take things that Jesus said as if, it's, it's to believers under grace. That It's clearly under an old covenant, an old covenant thinking. He refers to old covenant prophets and old covenant verses when he's speaking. It said he came but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel and to fulfill the promises given to the fathers. But they rejected him. So that's what's going on here. Jesus says, it says, in the meantime, there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trode upon one another. He began to say unto the disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. All right? They say one thing and do another. That's what he's saying. All right? 
For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. This is a warning of the judgment. These people might look good and righteous on the outside, but trust me, one day everything's going to be known. God sees it all. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear of closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. Jesus himself will be judged. We know that. These are warnings. There will be a judgment. Don't think just because you look good on the outside and righteous that God doesn't see it. You're going to answer for it. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. Okay? So he's telling the disciples, don't be scared of the people that persecute you and put you in jail or even threaten to kill you because that's all they can do. You should fear God, right? But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And in another place, Jesus says, fear the one who can not only kill the body, but kill both body and soul in Gehenna. That's Gehenna, the lake of fire. It was a trash heap outside of Jerusalem. The Jews would have known what that meant. Okay? Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are more value than many sparrows. And I say unto you, whosoever confess me before men, the Son of Man shall also confess before the angels of God. So this is about uh, acknowledging who Christ is, okay? Again, these Pharisees reject Jesus. The warning here is about the religious self-righteous who reject Jesus. That is the context here. It is not to believers, okay? It is not a threat against those of us who trust in Christ that we're not doing enough. All right, that is not what this verse is saying at all. We have to see the context here. See, those of us that are in Christ, we were born of God. We are born into his family. By grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, our works will be judged, but it will not determine where we spend eternity. It will determine how we spend it reward or loss of it, but not salvation. Salvation is a gift. It has nothing to do with your works. So, he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. So if you don't receive Christ and deny that he is the son of the living God who died for your sins, was buried and rose again, he doesn't know you, okay? So this is what he's saying. Those that receive me will be received by me. And those that reject me will be rejected by me, period. And when they bring you to the synagogues and unto magistrates and to powers, take ye no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought say. So he's warning the disciples here, hey, these people, including Pharisees, these hypocrites, they might put you in jail. They might try to put you to death. Don't worry about it because I am with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. He's going to tell you what to say, all right? And so don't even worry if they want to kill you because all they can do is kill the body. You just need to worry about fearing God, all right? Then one of the company said, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Do people even listen? This is so funny. And he said, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not of the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Then he tells a parable, okay? So we're not, that parable is not relevant to what we're saying here. So I'm going to go down to the disciples. And he said to the disciples, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body, what you shall put on. The life is more important than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouses nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are you better than the fowls? 
And which one of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? So he's telling him all this worry, pointless, can't do anything. Trust God, he's going to take care of you. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Then if God can clothe the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe ye, O little of faith? And seek not what you shall eat or what you shall drink, neither be doubtful of mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that you need of these things. But rather seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Keep God first, he'll take care of the rest, okay? Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that you have and give alms. Provide yourself bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approaches, neither moth corrupts. So what he's saying here is if, if you really care about spiritual things, you're not going to be so worried about these earthly things. Storing up stuff. He tells the story about the guy having so much that he stores up and he says, thou fool, tonight your soul's required of you. So you got all this stuff, but guess what? You're going to die tonight. It does you no good. So uh, he's saying, you want, you want real treasure? Sell everything and give it to the poor because that will be rewarded in the afterlife, in eternal life. It will be remembered by God. All right? Uh, and he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if you're focused on things of the world, your heart's going to be with the world. If you're focused on things of heaven, if you're focused on things like Jesus, He's going to be at the core of your mind and heart, right? So if you're focused on heavenly things, you're going to love your heavenly father. If you're focused on the world, you're going to love things of the world, right? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, right? So we are supposed to focus on spiritual things. And we get accused a lot of times saying, oh, uh, Life isn't worth anything until you die. You're so focused on the afterlife, you don't even care about what's going on here. But that's what he told us to do. Not to neglect things here, but to think of others here and to do the good work God told us to do. But to keep our heart on things in the heavens like our Lord, right? So where, Because where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Then he warns about the Son of Man coming at an hour when you think not, right? And Peter said to him, Lord, speakest thou this parable to us or even so to all? I skipped over a little bit of the parable when I was reading um, uh, chapter 12. So I'll read the whole thing through. But remember, the context here is the nation of Israel. He's warning them about rejecting him. They have a responsibility because to whom much given, much is required. They were given the law, the prophets, all the prophecies of him. They should have known the hour of their visitation, and they don't. This is a warning also of the religious hypocrisy. It says here, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, of the self-righteous religious leaders that don't believe in him, and how they have treated the sheep, the congregation, the nation of Israel, how they have ruled them unjustly, how they have imposed man's traditions on them instead of just God's law. Uh, and that is what he's fussing about here. That is what he's saying. He, he didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. There's, it's going to divide families, okay? So the warning here, people think this is a last day's warning for believers if you're not living right, he's going to appoint you a portion with the unbelievers. And that has nothing to do with this. This is the nation of Israel still under the law, should have known who he was. And the people that treat his people, the nation of Israel, badly by leading them wrong and taking advantage of them, being hypocrites, these leaders were, that they're going to pay for it. Okay, God sees everything. You think you can hide it? You look good to everybody, you look so righteous, but God sees it, right? So when he tells the parable of the servant, it's a warning to these self-righteous religious leaders. That's why he warns them in the beginning of the chapter. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, all right? They reject him 
as the promised Messiah. So let's look at the parable. I skipped through it because it's so long and gave you the gist of it. But I'm going to read it line by line here. And uh, the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give their portion of meat in due season? So he's talking about, the. this is a parable now, but it's referring to the religious leaders that were over the sheep of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find him so doing. Of a truth I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But, and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens and to eat and drink and be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and at an hour when he's not aware and will cut him in asunder and appoint him in his portion with the unbelievers. Okay, this is not a warning of last days believers being kicked out. This is a warning to the Jews, to the Hebrew people. You are wrong, unjustly ruling my people and they've rejected him. Okay, they didn't realize who he was. And appointing them a portion with the unbelievers would be, okay, you believe in the true God. But the only way to the Father is through him. So if they reject Jesus, they'll be given a portion with the unbelievers. That's the deal here. It has nothing to do with Christians in the last days and his second coming. I believe this is clearly about his coming then. I also believe it's a foreshadow of when he does return that these, these Pharisees, everything they ever did will be revealed at Judgment Day. But it's talking about the time now when he was there. They didn't recognize his, the master had come. He had returned and he was witnessing all that they had done. So, uh, in any case, it has nothing to do with believers uh, losing salvation or anything like that. The context is clear who this is about. Okay, guys. But it's a warning to the nation of Israel, okay? A warning against these self-righteous Pharisees that whatever they do to his sheep, they're going to pay for it. All right. Who is that faithful and wise servant who his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion and meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. This is a parable, okay? Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. So whatever you do here for the Lord will be rewarded in heaven, all right? But if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens and to eat and drink and be drunken, this is a parable. So he's warning those, see the nation of Israel is supposed to be his, his portion. Yet they reject him. And so he's warning those of you who were going to beat my sheep and throw them in jail and accuse them. When the Lord comes, his second coming, they're going to pay for it. That's what this is all about, uh, to eat and be drunken. And the Lord of that servant, so he's telling a parable of a guy that's a servant. The master leaves, the servant takes over the house and starts beating and abusing all of the other servants in the house. Okay, so when the master comes back and catches him off guard doing it, he's going to suffer for it. The same warning goes to the Jews, the or the Hebrew people, the nation of Israel. How you treat my sheep is going to be answered for. All right. Now we'll see there when he mentions you'll get a portion with the unbelievers. Some people say, well, it should have been hypocrites. No, I think unbelievers is fine because the nation of Israel believed in the true God. But when they rejected Christ, they would get the same portion as the unbelievers, those that didn't believe in the God of Israel, because they've rejected Jesus. So they'll have the same as unbelieving Gentiles, those that didn't worship the true God. 
So I think it's okay to put unbelievers here in this translation, considering he's talking to the nation of Israel. Um, because if they reject Christ, they will get uh, their portion with the unbelievers because they don't believe who Jesus is. All right, so he says, if the servant does these things worthy of stripes, uh, he'll be beaten with few stripes. But whoever much is given of him, much is required. So he's telling the nation of Israel, you got the scriptures, you got the prophets, you should know who I am. You've been given all of it. So who, who's much given, much is required. See, the nation of Israel should have known him. They should have known he fulfilled all the prophecies. But instead of acknowledging the virgin birth, they said, you're born of fornication. They were wicked. And so he's telling them, the nation of Israel was given everything. You should know who I am. So you were given much and much is required of you. So they are without excuse is basically what he's saying. I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with. He's talking about his death there. And how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Nothing is going to prevent him from going to that cross. Suppose ye that I have come to give peace on earth? I tell you nay, but rather division. He says but in another place, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Why? Because it divides the nation of Israel. It divides families. Some believe Christ is the Messiah. Some don't. It divides. It divides the Sanhedrin. He didn't bring peace. Everybody get along. No. Some reject him and some receive him. And there's division because of it. It's a, right down the line. Saved, unsaved. Today, it's the same thing. God's people, not God's people. Not all religions go to the same place. Jesus said, I am the way. No man comes to the Father but by me. The way, the truth, the life, it's him. He said it. So people can get mad at me if they want to, but I didn't say it, Jesus did. And I don't think he was a liar. So he's warning. No, I came to bring division. For from henceforth, there shall be five and one house divided, three against two, two against three. See, in Israel, there was division. Some people trusted Christ as Savior. Some people believed he was the promised Messiah. Some people didn't. We see that because John the Baptist says, why didn't you believe me then? Bring forth fruits meet for repentance. They didn't believe that to believe on Jesus, that he was the Lamb of God. They didn't believe it. All right. And he said to the people, all right, the father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter. You saw Paul. When he was Saul, he was divided against his brethren. The mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. And he said to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straight away you say, here comes a shower. And so it is. So he's, he's, he's condemning them for not seeing the signs. Okay? Where much is given, much is required. You guys have the scriptures, you have the Psalms, you have the prophets, you have the law. They all point to me. And you can't see it. All right. That's why he says you can see that, you know, hey, here comes rain when we see the clouds. But you couldn't see the signs of who I am. And when you see the south winds blow, you say there will be heat and it cometh to pass. You hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? He is talking to the nation of Israel. Do you remember in another place that says, you did not know the hour of your visitation? And it's the same thing here. They don't recognize that he is the promised son of God, the Messiah that shall be cut off, but not for himself, as the prophet said. Yea, then, why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? When thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, give diligence, since thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he hail thee to judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. I tell thee, thou shalt not depart thence, till thou hast paid the very last might. So all of this chapter is a warning of uh, not knowing who he is. 
So the parable that we uh, missed here is, I skipped over one of the parables about appointing it with the hypocrites or the appointing it with the unbelievers. In any case, it is a warning to those that don't recognize who he is. Because just because they believe in the true God and the law and all that, that doesn't save. You have to believe in Christ. And so the whole thing is about the leaven of the Pharisees, self-righteous hypocrisy. So uh, read Luke chapter 12 and you'll see that. Okay, God bless you guys.